So I returned from the Warsaw University Library. It's open at night, which is quite a feature. And it's 2.44 a.m. here in Warsaw, Poland. And I would like to read fragments of my work called The Metaphysics of Arete with some elucidation. How can we derive ethos? How can we derive the laws? How can we derive understanding of the world based on several premises in order to incorporate them properly, which is a duty of a master and a mistress to discover those natures, to understand them, to penetrate them with insight and to incorporate this arete, this virtue within, without universalizing it, without any moralizing, just trying to adapt to the changing nature and to our inner diamonds and our inclinations. So there are several ways which we may take on the Pythagorean fork, but there are also tested ones. So first of all, I would like to propose a theoretical structure in which I won't derive any particular virtues, as in, for example, Roman aretology or the Pythagorean Hellenic aretology, Egyptian aretology of the laws of Ma'at, the Arta of the ancient sacred Hindi ideas. Uh, so, how? So, it will be a bit of a reading with some elucidation. I don't like to repeat myself or be particularly superficial. So, let's engage with the text. Since most occult philosophies guiding towards success were set down already, every individual with enough sense, commitment, discipline and training may understand and incorporate these teachings within and shatter the fetters with the help of gods. Or understanding as a pratyaka buddhayana, that is a realization within or let's say downloading from the clouds of the gods and the eternal, the information contained in powers and forces a priori, predating and antedating human existence, as well as more civilized forces that went upstream and downstream in such modus operandi. It is rather that humans in great ignorance prefer to be blinded in great ways and ignore the quality, knowledge and realizations which they may pursue, rather than that the teachings are unavailable, occulted or obscure. Even if initiates find something, they may find charlatanly falsehoods, supermarket, new age, fringe beliefs, religious untruths and blinds, taking it for ver veritabilities. And the more they progress in their blindness, the greater the platonic catacombs they descend into. Catacombs, not even caves. People are all eyes, ears and minds if you satisfy their beliefs about the world and themselves. That common sense protects them, but it may be also populistically used in demagoguery against them. This is a quote from Kautilya or Chankya about uh, philosophy as the illuminating torch of the world. When veritable things are contradicting everything they live by, they protest, ridicule or flee. It is much harder and easier to remove the blinds on which our livelihood depends and reorganize successfully towards the starry pathways. It is a painful, painful journey, painful because the centuries of untruths and realization led to this point when to understand certain things, you need to go through strenuous effort of sacrifice, of pain, of toil, of sweat, of blood, and great understanding comes with experience. That's why learning must be approached by a discerning, discerning student, someone who is seeing the bullshit from a realization, someone who is mature enough to understand. Any form of indoctrination, brainwashing, is a violation upon the personal realization of a disciple. The learning indicates, it points towards, but it doesn't teach you how to live by it. That is why inferior minds never grasp the teachings. The medium ones require instruction and the superior minds grasp it on their own. This is the Arab idea from the inner teachings of Hlak Tok Buddhism. It is the quest of every new child to ascend and fill the thrones of gods. Yet when abandoning this miracle, children grow into old fools. All great work is done individually. All are sent to teach one's soul and diamond for every commitment laid at the altars of divinities in order to join the procession of the divine. 
Now each motion and change has a relation, interval, proportion, ratio, function, dynamics, entropy, harmonies, force, power, character, inclination, nature, just enumerations, both potential, actual, pronoic or foresighted, pre-taught, and generated after thought, manifested in the eternal present contingent to every time. It is made from co-arising codependent seeds that cast and project new seeds continuously on the function of the time events and phenomena. The Shakti is tainted by Vasanas. These are the seeds, everything we generate, everything that is introjected. Every perspective is giving different coordinates and points of reference. Although the autonomous system is indivisible, any ontology from within it is casting a projection based on its inner perception, sets of tainted vectors and fluxes and introjects an observation. This is an idea taken from physics, the black body, although I adapted it for the occult purposes. So the black body of the occult is giving away, is a hypothetical object that is giving away exactly the same aforementioned information from the powers and forces as it receives from the masks of gods. It is the perfect catalyst. The ontologies contained within the system are always straying from the perfect catalyst, that is, they are filtering the dynamics and ousia essences according to the necessity, ontologies as natures that are in existence, entities. In Galenian terms, the physician of Marcus Aurelius, Galen, the black body is, would be the eucratic component and serves as a point of reference, that is, health. While krasia, or, or generally magical competence in this context, is the ability to emulate aforementioned dynamics as close to the black body as possible, tainted by one's motive, desire, will, and vision, nevertheless. Each such point in time demands different approaches, tools, and perceptions in order to be concordant with the atmosphere and content of the motion and change, whether the motion of powers, forces, whether the planetary natures, whether natures amongst the world of nature, whether that of mortal beings, spirits, and so on. On the example of Olympiodor from Letters of Iamblichus, let us establish a principle that the highest activity of a mortal animal is to sustain the greatest, widest, highest perception and intellections and feelings to pitch one's diamond, soul, heart, mind and arete, gnosis aretos, in the most immovable, stable, homogeneous, continuous manner, preserving such an outlook for the majority of life, attuning to the high starry vaults and great natures of the planets, to the liberated gods and goddesses, and from them deriving all the qualities and proportions, intervals and ratios that are compatible with our own daimon and nature. We must understand our daimon, gnotis auton, and surpass it, to drag it towards the higher standards, to break the karman, the inclination. So, attuning to the high star revolts to the liberated gods, our inclination, the circumstances, fellow creatures and the world around us, but surpassing it in a degree that help us amend the corrosions and necessary corruptions encountered as mortals in the Aphrodite genetrics world, the world of nature. And I'm far from the idea that uh, matter or physics is evil. No, it is the perspective within that uh, is trying to disregard nature and matter. You must embrace it. And sometimes you are a spirit. Sometimes you are an enfleshed mortal as harmonies. You are walking as harmonies. When damage happens, you reorganize, you harmonize yourself. That is the duty to overcome and navigate towards the most beautiful and splendid divine things in moderation. And that moderation may be also found in divine pride. It doesn't put on superficial airs. It doesn't deflate or humiliate itself. It is neither burdened by excess, nor passion, nor by stern, sterile coldness. As an example, if you would offer the emperor's crown to a vile person, he would boast about it and he would be all crazy about it, gathering all forms of vice. Now, if an emperor, for example, Marcus Aurelius, is natural with his imperial autocratonic ability, self-governing, and he grows with his virtue, understanding and greatness towards the rank, then this is divine pride and this is natural pertaining to that 
particular person. So what you can handle, this is also the gradation of merit, of hierarchies, of understanding that each person with an inclusive society takes his natural path according to his ability, according to his value and virtue, not to deflate or inflate someone like happens in modern days. A bit like Confucian ideas that everyone has the meritocratic place and adapts to it, not being left out, but understanding his position in the world. So, so much for theory, let us analyze the metaphysics of ethos as it may occur on earth. Among mortals setting forth equations that describe the approximated conduct, incorporation of those divine ideas into our lifeblood, those powers, without being universalist, moralist, or any of such form of autocrats that enforce a being incompatible with nature, motion, difference, otherness, and chance among humans on others. There is no right of enforcing like in the totalitarian ideas for trying to make the society the way you like. This is a violation of freedom of order of any just force and power. Let us indulge, indulge in the categorical exercise, stripping the dynamics of forces of all sentiment and attempting to coldly analytically think, a quest in simplicity that cuts out the skeletal necessities for the purpose of defining more beautiful forms and ideas, but absolutely not constituting any theory of completeness. Hence, over change in time, we take such variables as motion, defined by force stemming from difference. This is the platonic idea of sameness and otherness, which creates this motion of difference. Difference as motion amongst flashes of phenomenal events. This is taken from the Buddhist teachings that everything we are surrounded, the dharmas are the phenomenal events, the flashes in time. Diversity defined as organizational entropy between minima, taken from Giordano Bruno, of total simplicity, through complex adaptive system, the caste systems to maxima of abysmal chaos, or a state of complete chaos is a state of complete rest, just as a case of total simplicity is a case of complete rest. Why is that so? Because when you reach the maxima of complete disorganization of all possible forms and you exploit that, what happens? The energy is so stretched that it minimizes it to a position of rest. And the patterns of events contain the rain. Causality, co-arising, codependent pockets of entropic causality. And what I understand as pockets of entropic causality is that within the topological spaces of the universe, everything goes through certain harmonies or disharmonies. Some systems are initiated, some stars are born, some are renewed, some are decaying, destroying, destroyed, the same like, like civilizations. So it is an interplotted idea that I like to call the Trimurti Klaus or the Brahman initiation, Vishnu or renewal, regeneration and sustenance and the Kali or Mahakali as decay and destruction back to the position of rest. And that goes through the ideas of order, the Mardukian harmony and disharmony. So the Trimurti goes through the Mardukian principles of ordering and disordering the world. So, causality co-arising codependent pockets of entropic causality in topological spaces are delimited by the deep grama of the universe spherically because it is a co-arising codependent entropy. Uh, the deep grama is something that we may call the physical objective uh, laws of the universe and the metaphysical objective laws of the universe. They are inseparable. They are a whole. That's why a sphere. And I know that the Copenhagen interpretation uh, denied the existence of certain deep grama of the universe or the ultimate law. And I'm, I'm not even playing, trying to conjure a theory of all because that fails. We have only limited categories and we cannot understand the universe throughout the universe. And that's why our mortal instruments, our uh, sciences and so on, 
create only categories of it. There, there is no theory of everything that a mortal being can grasp. As I posit, there are separate categories and laws that we may grasp, and according to that, we create our technology, and so on, so. So, a simple physical causality causes B, A causes B on the horizontal linear level. That's the most simple causality ever. It is not multipolar, it, is, it has a certain vector, a certain valence. Therefore, causality has a relational pattern between differences, sameness, force, and motion. Now, deriving the total sum of these qualities constitutes a metacycle and is based on knowledge, observation, perspective, understanding, insight, experiment, hypothesis, imagination. We draw from our imagination in order to establish notion. Notions, Plotinian notions, are the points where the metaphysical and our intellections meet and they walk. They are interlocked. That means that we approximated and realized certain truths in such a manner that they walk. We cannot possess the truth in itself. The truth doesn't belong to us, but it walks. So, this is a little interjection here. What a wondrous thing that within a single short lifetime, a mortal, of a mortal, we may carry the weight of thousands of years of history in order to understand our place in the world. In a way, we are all prisoners of the present if we don't use this. But those who seek the past and futures contain millennia within their life and they see the infinite past and the infinite future. This is guided a bit by the citation from Goethe, uh, that great master, uh, that we are prisoners of the present if we don't know the 3000 years of history of great civilizations and cultures surrounding us. That's a paraphrase of it. Let's go even further. Then from what is derived from observation, from an inner wisdom, we draw maps, and the map is not the territory, citing Kozybski, of relational causality spanning celestial motions, gods, nature, and mortals. It's a bit like in the Book of Changes. We have the hexagram that is divided into the celestial creative heavens, the, air, the, the man and earth. So each two uh, duograms are divided, uh, the, the trigram is divided into duograms. And in such way, we build it up. Of course, naturally, it was built from three grams that constitutes a hexagram, but that's mathematics and hermeneutics uh, behind the Book of Changes. So, we establish what qualities and essences pertain to each one of them over time, trying to scale it, understand it, hence drawing bridges through times and spaces, geographies of the sacred, profane, temporality of transient, and atemporality of the infinite. Thus, we are establishing the essence and qualities for each, each given time in this change in motion, and the greater response of change in motion, we establish what is superior, what is the medium, what is inferior, what is the general median, what is the common, what is the minima, what is the maxima, and what is the common denominator of the time we live in, and how we may amend it by greater times, and how we should act in order to adapt and maximize the excellence according to the discoveries we made, and draw from them to incorporate it in our life and in the societal fabric. Thank you.